Hey, I'm Jeff Yager. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics. And I'm Vladimir Mojica. I'm a professor of chemistry. So, Vladi, we're making this video today because you and I are co-instructing BCH341, which is physical uh, chemistry with a biological focus this spring 2019 semester. And it's just getting going. And so what I have is, uh, I have an external WordPress site, biopchem.education, that I keep up, uh, where I keep a lot of the materials so that even if ASU Canvas goes down or something, we have it. And so from here, um, I can, I have the spring 2019 semester, and I'm gonna pull up the syllabus, which is the same um, uh, syllabus that uh, you would get if you got on Canvas directly. So, right. so it's just a copy of that. In fact, Canvas just links to this one directly. And this is a, uh, a Google document that you and I went back and forth on and kind of settled in on, on some of the details for this course. And this is a PDF version that we're gonna use for this semester. Um, I don't think we need to you know, go through kind of some of the, the basics of this. I think what will help students the most is to really to get into the heart you know, of what they care about. This just gives them some contact information or kind of learning objectives. We're gonna learn uh, mainly the macroscopic theory of uh, biochemical processes or thermodynamics, and then finally some of the time scale stuff, kinetics. Um, and going through some of the logistics, uh, there's several good books to use. Uh, we're primarily pulling stuff out of physical chemistry for the life sciences, but uh, on the on ground uh, class uses Tinoco. A lot of times professors will just use our own notes, etc. This is such a well advanced field. There's so much information out there on this. Yeah. Um, you would say there's yeah, a lot just, of resources. Just a minor comment there. We have a textbook, of course, Atkins and DePolo. Right. But students should realize, as you're saying, that this is a field where there are dozens of good books. Maybe I so, maybe hundreds. Yeah, to be hundreds, honest, yeah. if you so, in thermodynamics in yeah, general, going yeah. back to Lewis and so Randall Hill, it is. You know. I mean, of course, we we give this textbook information because it's a way to organize things. But if you are curious enough, just go out and read some of them by yourself right. because it is really. I mean. It, Learning physical chemistry is not about learning how to solve problems. Solving problems is very important, but it's concepts together with problem solving that is going to give you a good handle on this. And this is very hard to achieve just going, you know, mechanically. Linearly through, through just one example. example. In fact, I, you would say it's probably our number one goal outside of our main goal being that as experts to evaluate students' knowledge in this field, you'd say our second most important goal is, in a sense, the, the role of teaching or, or providing as much information and as different types of information so that students can learn this material, so that, that we outline what we think are good resources for them you know, to learn this material, including videos. Uh, but um, uh, to speak on what you just said, you know, if a student asks me, like, how did you learn, take any basic topic in thermodynamics, how did you really, you know, learn this topic, you know, when you were learning, you know, Gibbs free energy or, or biochemical uh, thermodynamic processes, I can, the first picture that comes to my mind is four or five textbooks and yeah. or articles or reviews and stuff and, and lecture notes open where I looked at how five you know, prominent people who I thought understood it well and could explain it to others well, reading or watching videos yeah. or listening to them lecture, etc. how they did it. And right. it was never <clears throat> just one. No. It was and, always and will, me and assimilating add, several yeah, things. Yeah. And I will add that, of course, I agree with you. The other thing is I learned a lot from my classmates. I mean, we have this peer review uh, system to grade uh, exams in this course, which is quite interesting. But I'm going to tell you that we had the study groups and they were so demanding, you know, we were so demanding with each other that actually I learned probably the same or more from these discussions because they will challenge me, I will challenge them to go well beyond what the book will say. And we were merciless. Yeah. And so I know that online is difficult to do this. But try. I mean, it, it's really an interesting effort to try to get. Well, and I think we're at a fundamental time where 
you know, the internet and its ability to add communication levels that, you know, a lot of times people will use technology, but they don't, they, they never replace what we're doing right here. One-on-one, -on -one, sitting in study groups with your peers, you know. But I would say we're finally getting to some of these technologies and social media platforms really allowing fast dissemination of, of other people's ideas in kind of an asynchronous way mm -hmm. so that you can post a question and have a lot of other students comment on it. And is it as efficient as, as in person, but you do eliminate a lot of getting everyone into the right, same right, place. Right. So probably there are some efficiencies yeah. and some inefficiencies yeah. that come with some of that. But, you know, especially with modern social media, with things like Snapchat, where you're not just having to text or, or write little things where you're sending video chats back and forth, you can disseminate a lot of information in a minute, kind of right. like we're doing right you now. You know, you have this uh, yellow, what is yellow, dig. Ye yellow dig. I mean, you wouldn't believe how much it helps if one of you posed there a question that is a difficult question. Yeah. Because then you are helping everybody, including yourself. Because when the, when the answer comes back, and very often these questions that, or some of them look trivial, but they are not, or they might be truly difficult questions, but you really learn a lot from dissecting these questions and going through what is implied and then going in different directions it's, it's amazing, really, uh, how much you, you learn out of that. Way more than just sitting and going th through one book and solving the problems in that book. Again, problem solving is very important. Problem solving is not everything. Right. So, okay. So, and, and to that regard, you would say that's part of what the syllabus does is try to give a lot of different resources, both links where they can find, you know, computational resources so they can kind of do your own type computation to learn some of this, uh, books, you know, so that they could potentially have two or three ebooks or, or physical hard copy books in front of them, um, you know, when learning some of this. What we're doing here, which is trying to make series of videos, linking to other people's videos uh, and other, you know, complete things that um, video series and stuff where we feel like they discuss these topics well, et cetera. Um, and like you said, it really is the combination of trying to look at and get a handle on some of these concepts and then working problems. And that's really where the suggested homework comes in is, is giving it that template to work a real problem and hopefully understanding the concepts as they're working them. You know, and hopefully some of the quest, uh, questions that they're answering have both a conceptual as well as a problem solving, you know, component associated with it. And then that translates to the graded component of this. While the homework isn't directly graded, I would say it's indirectly graded in that these homeworks are the jumping off points for problems for exams and the jumping off points for some of the multiple choice conceptual quiz questions, et cetera. So, and, and there they will have what I would call common electronic type uh, quizzes in Canvas. I don't think we need to belabor that one too much. Uh, the one I do think that maybe is worth a few minutes of conversation is exams, uh, you know, we're gonna be doing this what I would call different from what I would call the, the norm. The norm to me uh, in a lot of undergraduate level courses is lockdown browsers of uh, some type of electronic quiz type examination where uh, you know they're submitting everything electronically through Canvas, et cetera. And what we're, ours is much more in the fashion of a take home exam exactly. or what <clears throat> I would call you know a short compressed homework set, you know. Right, but probably, you know, when we are doing this fully online, very often we feel compelled to use multiple choice questions. Now, there are good things and bad things about multiple choice. You, you, cannot, you cannot play with all freedom, with many things in the way you elaborate the question. So here, we are going back to exam types where, of course, you might have a multiple choice, but it's like if you were sitting or a home take or, or in a classroom, I'm taking the exam there. Because you will have the opportunity to write what you think, not just multiple choice. Multiple choice, you don't write anything. I mean, you don't even have to explain to me how do you right. do it. And as it turns out, you know, in many cases, it is just almost random. If you, if you have four, four choices for, for different answers, you, you do it randomly, you have 20% yeah. probability to get it right. 
and you go to three, you have uh, more than 30% probability. So we don't want that game. We want you to think about the question, you know, and explain to us how do you, how, how do, you do it? Well, I think it's also critical because now we're getting towards these upper division undergraduate levels. So this is gearing towards careers where bio, uh, in biochemistry or, or chemistry or molecular level sciences. And guess what? You know, when you sit in, in the laboratory or you're asked to do things, you know, you're, they're not asking you a multiple, choice, multiple type, choice type thing. They're asking you, go figure this out, you know, solve this problem, get this working in the lab, figure out what concentrations we need to use or what, what biological system we need to do this in. Mm -hmm. They're asking you to solve more open-ended questions that don't have always just a very definitive, you have to work it this way, this is the right way, this is the wrong way. In fact, you know, there's often a lot of different ways to approach the same problems. And I think that's one of the things we're trying to emphasize in Absolutely. this course. Absolutely. And, and the, the boundaries of science are being redefined every day. And so, so now traditional fields in chemistry and biology just disappear, like analytical chemistry. Analytical chemistry has been taken over by physical chemistry. When I was a student, analytical chemistry was a separate course but not anymore. And there are many examples now, the boundaries between physics and biology or physics and chemistry, they are being rede re, you know, redefined by, because of computers, because of tools, because of the way we think the brain is a... Now, the point is that if what you learn is problem solving and multiple choice, you're dead. Yeah. In, in simple terms. Yeah. And so hopefully this course and, and the way we've outlined the syllabus is to try to, you know, combat some of these and, and put things in more uh, terms that will help long term in career, uh, scientific career. As you mentioned, and I, I don't think we could overemphasize this, peer-to-peer -peer learning, peer-to-peer -peer communication, not just that peers have good access to us as instructors or TAs, et cetera, but learning from their fellow peers is a challenge for online people, but yet at the same time, one that we are trying to address in this syllabus and we keep trying to address in this course. And one of the things we've done this semester is to make a lot of the participation in Yellow Dig, which hopefully that's just the catalyst to getting them to communicate with each other and helping each other solve problems with concepts, uh, etc. cetera, uh, in this. And so- So that uh, would be the P2P learning. Hopefully, we'll see, you know. Uh, well, that's easier to assess after the fact. I can say I've used this in past semesters. The more I use it, the more I see them, uh, you know, developing these peer-to-peer -peer network groups. Um, so uh, hopefully that'll play out again this semester as well. Uh, again, I, 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 I like to highlight the tentative here, but I do like to, you know, this is a short, uh, course, a lot of our uh, students are taking this all over the world or, or online and they have very, you know, busy schedules with very, you know, uh, prescribed times uh, that they can work on things. So coming up with very specific kind of due dates and holding to some of these and, and, and stuff I think is, is critical for students to be able to plan uh, effectively uh, uh, in a modern way. Um, so, so, you know, and each one of these emphasizes kind of a you know, a, a quiz, and then every other week they take these uh, exams. And as you mentioned, besides uh, focusing on peer-to-peer -peer in this yellow dig, which they get participation points for just um, answering polling questions, helping each other with problem solving and conceptual solving, et cetera, um, by getting on and, and helping each other in, in, uh, in this social network, um, they also, uh, we're gonna look into uh, on these exams, making them where they're peer, anonymously peer graded. So they will you know, be able to help their peers and see how their peers are working certain problems. And this is one, as I mentioned to you earlier, I have played around with in the past and made it optional last semester. And we're gonna try to make this integral into their examination mm -hmm. score this semester because it was so successful. Uh, last semester, and we're, um, you know, uh, working on some of the details of, of what exact peer system in Canvas we can use to do this effectively. And oftentimes, unfortunately, it does come down to some of those practical technological things that can get in the way. And part of our goal is, is to try to eliminate those as much as we can, you know. Um, 
we kind of give. So participation in these peer-to-peer -peer things are a good, you know, we, we emphasize that in the grading, that it's a quarter of their grade, you know. Quarter of their grade are these, um, you know, quizzes that they can take multiple times, that their highest quiz counts, so they can run through these bank of questions and really hone their skills to make sure they're understanding some of these problems, et cetera. And then 50% of their grade is this, what I would call, you know, at, now that we're at the upper division stage in undergraduate education, you know, these ones where it gets much more in, you know, problem solving on open-ended questions that can be worked in lots of different ways and maybe don't have some specific unique answer are more project oriented in nature. They're almost more like moving towards lab reports too. Um, and this is a lot of what I like that the book does. It'll say like, hey, look at this modern field. Right. Go read a paper and come mm -hmm. back with a perspective, right? Yeah. Those are modern methods of keeping up to date in an area and using that in practical ways. And I want to, to emphasize this. You already said that, but in this course, it is either you can take the midterm exams and the final exam is not mandatory. You can use the final exam as a way to improve your, your grade, assuming that you didn't do so well in one of the midterms, and then you can use the, the, the final. So this is something that is not very common, right. but I think it's very, it's very interesting and good idea. The way I like to put it, and if somebody asks me conceptually explain why you do it this way, I like to say simply, you know, uh, you can learn you know, every other module we're going to give you an exam. And if you can, you know, keep up to speed in the class and learn as you go, and then you will be able to do well on those three midterm exams, you have learned that material consecutively. But it's not that uncommon that, say, exam two, there was some concept and, you know, and practical things in your life going on that you just didn't learn it. And it came across in that exam that you didn't learn it. Now you still have time to learn that to build on that for exam three. Well, if you want to show me at the end that, hey, maybe I didn't get it as I went, but I pulled it together at the end and in a comprehensive final, I showed that I understood all the concepts. You should, that's the goal is to understand this material. And whether you, you prove it through one comprehensive final at the end, or you can prove it systematically yeah. as you go, either one is fine with us. Um, Okay, and then we're using standard grading. Uh, I mean, we can add pluses and minuses, but I like to, you know, these, it, it stands on kind of a, a pretty standard grading scheme, which gets a little easier as you get down uh, below average. And, you know, the rest of it is, is so, fairly boilerplate. Yeah, before you go into, so do you want to say a word or two about curving? Because this is a question I often ask. Yeah, um, generally what I've found, and, and uh, you know, I would say, you know, curving will be done, you know, uh, only, the only part that would be curved at all are the examinations, the quizzes, the yellow dig persistation. This is all, if you put the effort in, you should be able to get all the points right. for that. And, and I, I tend to did, do, that I that tend to do the curving as I, you know, per exam so that it, there's no curving at the end. Mm -hmm. It'll get curved through the peer review, uh, uh, through the grading of each one you know, process uh, so that they will know their grade and they won't have to wait till the very end to know, well, is there gonna be a bigger curve or a smaller one? So I tend to, the only part that even has the possibility of curving is the examinations themselves. And I usually do it in the grade they get for that examination, so. Okay, well, hopefully uh, students will find this kind of general discussion of going through the main points of this exam illuminating uh, for this semester. And if you have further questions, I think uh, we, it's a perfect setup for please get on Yellow Dig, ask us. Right. You know, besides using Yellow Dig for what it's there for, which is to learn from your peers and, and instructors the material we're gonna cover, we're also very happy, you know, we, we realize that oftentimes what I would call logistic and practical questions come up and we're happy to address those so that everyone is very clear right. about any aspects and, and of the And we favor syllabus. very much that you ask questions through Yellow Dig. 
except yeah. when it's a very personal question, but because all the students learn from the questions. That they Usually want. asking just that, do you do pluses and minuses? This, why, we don't want to get that in an email over and over, the same question. Exactly. It's much better that it just get asked on Yellow Dig, and then they can see all the comments. The same about curving and any other thing, right. because they all learn, you all learn from the questions at one of each. Okay, well thank you.